All right. So today we're doing systematics. Okay. Um, <coughs> here's another video describing the new species discovered last year. Okay. So in many areas in the class, when we talk about something, there's someone in the room who knows more than I do. You may have noticed this. Um, this time, it's at least Aaron and probably others of you too. So if you look at the EB blog, you'll see the latest post is about a new species discovered by someone in this class. So if you too take this class, you can discover new species too. Um, <coughs> so I'll keep that in mind for today. All right, so <coughs> systematics. So the thing about this, this two levels is sort of alpha taxonomy, describing new species, and higher level taxonomy. Okay? Um, and so that was earlier, these are all different different species um, concepts, right? And when you're describing new species, you use whatever species concept you like. Okay? Um, across some issues. Now one thing that's supposed to help with this is that as species diverge, you get this raised element so you can argue over the different species, but here, you know, you don't see species in oak tree. Right? You know this. Um, you're not, you're not in the so, I mean, this is fuzzy area, and we fight in the fuzzy area, right? But a lot of life is not in the fuzzy area. Okay. And the hope is that, you know, at some point you start getting the diagnosable differences between the populations, and then you, you know, have, you know, complete lack of, last, lack of inbreeding, in, interbreeding, then you get monophyly of one, to talk about what that means. And they can't interbreed with each other anymore, um, and so forth. Okay. <coughs> so depending on the concept, you might say, okay, if they're diagnosed to be different, they're different species, or if they can't interbreed anymore, they're different species. All right. So people who, who, who adopt different definitions will argue about here. Right. But after this point. So, the only species is a really hard problem. Okay, so why is it hard? Well, first of all, imagine we have this group of, in, this group of organisms in a population. Right? And you want to say, how many species are there? Well, you could split them, you know, this way. Or you could split them this way. Or you could split them this way. Okay? And actually, um, the number of ways to split them, those of you who are math geeks like this, it's totally different. You know, so you don't have to remember that for test. Um, for each of these 30 samples, there's 34 trillion ways to divide them between species. Okay. Um, and actually, we're, people develop software, so I wrote software that does this, and other people have written software that does this too. Okay, that sort of helps taxonomists, so sort of relies on taxonomists to actually give their expert opinion about this too. Okay. <coughs> and so, what people often do is, you know, you often won't have species distributed in this continuous distribution, they will find clumps, and that can help you. Like, is this population the same as this population? Or is this individual from this individual? Okay. Um, there's a difficult problem. Okay. Um, now, the species concept people use mostly, you know what it is? Most common species concept on this list? Biological, yes. So, species of groups of interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. Right, how do you test reproductive isolation? Try to meet them, right? So we could do an experiment like this, where we say, okay, here are a whole bunch of these large cats. Which one are the different species? Right? And so you can try breeding them all, and sometimes they'll interbreed, sometimes they'll kill each other. Um, <coughs> right? And some of the crosses you'll actually get, you know, between these lions, tigers, Tiger or tiger. Those are actually the terms, depending on which parent is the tiger. Is it the mother of the tiger or the father of the tiger? I forget. Anyone know? Yeah, not something at least enough for the test. Yeah. Um, look it up. Okay, so we find that, you know, this can do with this or this, or this can do with that. So, let's say, are they different species or the same species, right? But also, it's very hard. Thing to do in practice, right? If you're <coughs> doing a group of ants, 
right? So they have one breeding flight a year, right? So you, then you capture them at the same time and then try to mate them, and you know, FedEx them, you know, in overnight flights, see if they can mate with something from a different part of the world. No, right? <coughs> so actually, developed, actually testing by mating experiments is the obvious thing to do, but it's hard to do. Okay, what people tend to do instead is find things that might correlate with this lack of interbreeding. Okay, and then, and then what that tells you is have they been interbreeding in nature? It doesn't tell you that they can't interbreed. Right? Just what, the, what have they been doing? If it's slightly different than the BSC, it's probably correlated in many cases. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Alright, so, of course, in this class now, the, your first inclination is to be, oh, let's use trees. Right? Okay, let's use trees. How do we do that? So, <coughs> not that we have, you know, phylogenies between species, we have phylogenies within species, right? If I could take all your mitochondria and sequence them, right, I'd find, you know, so here's our, our class. Let's find, okay, these two have, go back, you know, a thousand years and have a common ancestor, and then these two go back 300 years and have a common ancestor, and at some point, everyone in this class would connect, right? And Oh, there's another reason why you don't want to use basal derived. You're talking about tips, right? Who's the basal member of the class? Who's the derived member? Of the class? Well, you know, equal age. Yeah, so. Um, <coughs> so you can make these trees within species. Okay? So if we have this genealogy of potential species, there's a definition of species um, such as the smallest. Well, it's, a, it's a small as clade possible. Right? So here, you know, A is a clade relative to B. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can go through and find these clades. <coughs> and you look at, you look at from what we get multiple genes. Okay? So, for example, we have these gene trees. Right? If we sort of add up the gene trees and make a consensus of them, what, what, what would that mean? What would be a consensus of this sort of thing? So you haven't been taught this yet, so it's okay if you don't know. Yeah? No, good question. Yeah, these are different genes. So, right, so my mitochondrial genes and my Y chromosome have, have different histories. Right, so within us, all our genes have different histories, and so these are different different genes that are independently sorted. Yeah, good question. Okay. And so, how, if I were to say do a consensus, what do you think a consensus might mean in this case? What what, what does consensus mean in general? Agreement. Right. So if we reach a consensus on the debt ceiling. Right, we have a general agreement. Um, <coughs> so, what would a consensus for trees mean? What would what, what, what's the agreement here? Yeah, a grouping of all those for those all, all for those trees that represents the stuff they all agree on. Right? So for example, they agree that I and J are supposed to each other. Who has I and J sister? That's good. This one? This one? No? So they don't agree on that. Right, so consensus won't have I and J being sister. And actually for this trace, it would be hard to look at with the scale. In this tree, this is a consensus of this. Right, so in all of them, we have an F and K code. Right? Relations with that clade differ? Okay. We always have that clade. So we show that clade. <coughs> and so in a genealogical species concept, 
you would call this a species. Why would they, so I mean, sure it's okay, why, why would this be relevant as a species concept? What sort of process are they trying to get at with this? Okay, so imagine I took the first three rows of the class and said, put you guys on an isolated, isolated island, right? And then came back you know, many generations later. What I find about the Jane trees in that population? So, okay, here's the front row, front two rows. Okay, so you have some sort of, let's do, okay, here's the front few rows, here's the rest of humans. Then we look at your phylogeny. It's right, something like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. Right? So interdigitation, right? Because you have a sibling who happens not to be in this class, right? And things like that. Okay. Then I put the barrier. So now let's say you guys have four offspring in the next generation. Okay. Well, it might be that like that, like that, but only up like maternally inherited to this. That and that. Right? And next generation. That. That. And next generation. Perhaps that. Right? So now we have this long period of not interbreeding with anything else. What's happened to the gene tree? Where are the clades? So the several clades, right? They're separate, right. So these are now evolving on their own in some way, right? Whatever. But now this population is a clade, right? They've all coalesced to um, one sort of gene history, okay? And so I can tell they have been interbreeding for a while because they all form a clade. And so the reasoning to use this sort of definition is that if you form a clade for all these genes, you must not be exchanging genes with something else, right? Because if now, you know, one, one of these is over here, right, that was no longer a clade here, right? If there's some, some interbreeding, this would not be a clade anymore, okay? So presence of a clade so across many genes suggests that there is lack of interbreeding, right? Which, if we think that's what depth species are, because they don't interbreed with other things, then it might indicate it's a species. Right? Without having to look at anything, without having to, you know, look at stuff with a microscope or squash chromosomes or anything like that, you just get the gene trees, boom, create the species. Okay? We have any problems with this. Yeah. Because there wasn't what? Right, but then they wouldn't be, but then in this definition, they wouldn't be different species.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, even a little bit of interbreeding, you know, could mess up this coalescence. And so, yeah, so, I mean, this is very stringent criteria. So, yeah, even though in general things don't interbreed at all, you could have occasional interbreeding. And then, as I say, up, oh, they're the same species. Yeah, good. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's other processes that can lead to sort of confusing and con trouble with the gene trees, so gene duplication, things like that. It's not going to but it's a good point. I think we mess it up. What else? Okay, we're naming clades. We have this nice clade here. One if yes, two if no. So yeah, so our A through E are clade. One yes, two no. Ooh. So is the disagreement. So the answer is two. What's a clade? Well, what group, what does that mean? Ancestors from all the stems, right? So ancestors from all the stems, right? So the ancestors of these consists all the stems of that group of both of them, not just A through E. So they're not a clade. Right? So that. They could be a clade. It could be that when we resolve this polytoning, it's, you know, clade of A, C, B, C, D, E. It could also be that. E is sister to this group and A, B, C, D are played. Right? So it's not going to be played. Okay? So what, what do you do with those in this genealogic species concept? Well, you have two options. You could make them parathenous species, or you could usually do what you call it a meta species. Another issue. <coughs> Another issue is times until you get this monophyly, right? So in this pop, you know, I isolate you on an island, it takes a while for you to get monophyly, right? How long will it take you? It'll take you two generations, it'll take you a million generations, okay? <coughs> and these plots show how long you get monophyly in all, in all genes, okay? Once you know the population size of time, okay? And by the time you have these really fast, but for, you know, one gene takes a while, five genes takes a while, and this concept is based on being right up here. Okay? Having complete reciprocal monophyly for all genes. So that can take a really, really long time. So this definition, are humans and chimps the same species or different species? Any of any, any, any alleles you have in common? We're not going to play. So blood type, right? So some of us are A, some of us are AB, some of us are B. Same for, same for chimps, right? So those of you who are A are more closely related to chimps at that allele than those of you who are B. The, 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 sorry, those of you who have A are more similar to chimps than, those, than, the, than you are those of you, those of you who have B at that gene, right? So you have things like that that lead to lack of lack of one side. So, it's not a species concept people don't use that much anymore. Um, it's sort of an interesting approach. Okay. <coughs> There's a new hot approach. DNA barcoding. Okay. Um. <coughs> so here's the basic idea is okay, within species, things are very similar for the for their metaphor set. Between species, between you know Members of the six different species in the same genus, members of the same different species in the same family, often differ by a lot. Right? So handy metric is saying, okay, how different are you? If you're less different than two percent, you're in the same species. Okay. Well you can do something like this.
Oh, so this is cytochrome oxidase 1, which is a mitochondrial gene uh, used in respiration, I believe. It doesn't mean it's easy to amplify. Yeah. And so why do you want to use this approach rather than, you know, testing breeding in the lab or doing a whole gene phylogenase? It's faster, right? So you can sequence <coughs> a single gene very quickly and cheaply. Okay? I actually hope for having a DNA recording tricorder. Actually, in their presentations, they advertise this, and they're going to have a thing where you can just go and then, boom, your C1 sequence is X. You're the species. They don't have that yet. Um, and this has been used. So <coughs> here's a case of birds. Okay? And you know, some, some groups have really well worked out species level taxonomy. You have to really care about them and study them. So birders love collecting bird species as observations, right? So they really know about bird species. Whereas fungi, I mean, there's probably two people in the world people in the room here who care about fungi, and that's like half half the world who cares about fungi is in the room right now. That's not, not real. But you know, it's a huge diverse group um, that a lot of people are working on it. Okay? So, so there's a lot of more work to do still with fungi. Okay? But even with birds, the approach found that there's two zoopipers that are very, very different. Okay. As different as many other species, okay. we're working on this touch. Okay. It's good that there's actually this, these cryptic species. Okay. Um, <coughs> what can be the problem with this, then? It seems to work great. <laughs> right, but I mean, this variable cutoff thing is an issue, right? It's because, like, let's say we said cutoff of you know, 1%, it's great, get this huge bar. But also, we find, you know, 2% of things that are different species in the same genus would also be incorrectly split by that. Or would be, would be, would be yeah. right, so there's no, you know, the hope is that there is. This much difference in different species, and way over here, different properties, different just so differences in uh, different species and different species, right? But actually, it's like more like that, sort of overlap, okay? Because we know speciation is a continuous process. There's nothing to be like two of different species, as is gradual. There's always going to be an overlap, and so then there's issues with some of the overlap of it. Okay, that said, this is handy for people who are doing like, a rapid assessment of. You know, in this, you know, group of bacteria, how many species do I have? I don't know that. <coughs> Most analyses of looking at like ways to limit species still use sort of this kind of approach, right? We use various various pieces of evidence, and an expert goes through and decides, right? So here's one of my advisors, a PhD student, who's describing a new species of ant. Right, <coughs> and you know describes the, the workers, and then talks about like, you know, the difference from other species in size, shape, regular node. It could be in looking at genes too, where it occurs. So many sources of evidence requires an expert to say, "Yep, this is different." Okay, and so that's still what's done most commonly. Okay, and those of you who are describing species, really make sure of this, and also probably use molecular data too to give you. A other information, okay? But you can imagine how slow this is, right? So you have to look at a whole bunch of specimens and say, yep, yeah, you know, the, the, the posterior margin of the sectorial process is similar in some species, and not quite similar in other species. So you have to look at a lot of things to tell it apart. Right? It's a long process. Now, Aaron, when you're describing your new species, how long did that study take you? Yeah. 
And Aaron's a fast worker, compared to most outside of us, right? So I mean, this takes a long time to do properly. Right? I'm assuming he did it properly. Right? <coughs> okay. So, you know, given that we have all this diversity in life, that we're still discovering things, I mean, 18,000 new species a year, you know, there's this tension between are we doing it fast enough, are there fast ways to do it, we also want to do it well, right? Why does it matter that you do it well? What, you know, so, you know, I could use barcoding and, yeah, get right a lot of the time. I mean, some things in the middle, they don't get right. All right. You know, I'm doing well 90% 90, 90 of the time. Seems pretty good. In baseball, that'd be stunning, right? So there'll be a problem with that if I do it with you. You have those errors. And why do we care about finding species well at all? Right, so when you talk about something, or you have clear observations about something, and say, okay, well, I know this species, I know what it does, you have to have that accurate. So it's the case of an invasive species, people want to use a biological control on it. So biological control means rather than killing with chemicals, you kill it with another organism. Okay? So you could use, you know, myxoma virus on rabbits in Australia and kill them that way. So biological warfare. Right? It kind of like. Um, <coughs> and it's a case where people introduced a parasite of an organism, but since they've gotten the species wrong, they actually didn't attack that species. Okay? And so had they done the taxonomy well, they would have figured that out. Okay? Um, <coughs> when we look at things that, we look at questions like we talked about last time about diversification rates, right? Is this group really diverse or not? Well, it could be that this group isn't really diverse, it is really diverse and we've just missed it because we've, we've undersplit it. Right? That people haven't looked at it well. So it was actually 10 species, actually, actually one species. And actually, there's a case where barcoding actually helped with this. There's a butterfly species um, where the caterpillars look sort of similar and the adults look sort of similar. But when they actually did the barcoding, they found there were these 10 different groups. And looking, they found that each group was specialized on a different host plant. They thought it was actually a generalist species, was in fact a bunch of specialist species they had missed. They looked similar to the human eye, okay? but they were very different uh, molecularly. Okay, that tells me about how evolution works, they got wrong ahead of time. And so that's the taxonomy effect. Right, so you go back to... Yeah, good idea. Go back to here. Right, I mean, so you know, everyone agreed on these two. Everyone agreed on one. But from here, you know, Splitters versus lumpers is the you know, term that's used for those people. The splitters make multiple species, lumpers make them. Okay. Okay. So the species is so Type specimens are very important when describing species. Okay, so <coughs> imagine I have so say the, the case of like the butterfly species is actually ten butterfly species. Okay, so I'm going to split into ten ones. Which one gets the original name? Which of those ten is the same as the original description of that species? Well, wherever the type is, right? So if that so it's the type is the specimen uses an epitome of what that species looks like. And then you compare, and that's when they don't know if it's the same species or different species, I can say, you know, are you similar enough to that type or not? Okay. 
and when it's split, the name goes with the type. Okay? So if, <coughs> you know, humans, if you're like, oh wow, humans are actually two species, which they're not, having assumed that, then those who are most similar to Linnaeus, who's our type specimen, um, goes with him, and then the other ones would be, you know, Homo macensis or whatever. Now, here we see um, number of species discovered through time. Okay. Here we see it. And so, people, all people who <coughs> describe species are worried because we're not describing as many as we used to. Okay. Now, some of the job of the taxonomist, though, isn't to make new species, it's to collapse species. But sometimes people oversplit things, um, and so it's the job of taxonomists to go and you know collapse them back together. So your net output might be negative species. I've described negative five species this year. Yay! But that that's actually can be useful. It's right? over oversplit. <coughs> all right. So you all learn this in class, right? At some point, you know. And so let's say you want to work for a great sushi. <laughs> right? Um, <coughs> or whatever number you want for that. Right? Um, and so this is the traditional taxonomy. And we also shoehorn, you know, we must have like subgenera, subfamilies, super order, super orders. Um, so ways of inserting new ranks in that level. Okay? And so we talked about species. Okay? And so, codes. So these aren't like source codes. These are like sort of the rules we live by. It's like Fight Club rules, okay? But for taxonomy. And so, <coughs> the different ones are different small organisms. Okay. And these do certain things, but not other things. So these codes tell you, you know, if I split that species, one species in ten species, the fact that the name moves the type, that's what code says to do. Okay. If we lump two species into one, which name do we use? The prettier name? The name that our buddy came up with? No, the name that came first. Right? And again, that's from the codes. Okay. <coughs> um, but one odd thing is that the codes are independent. Okay. So for example, here we have two species. Okay. And this is Purus Rape. Okay. And this is Purus Tonica. Right? So are these in the same genus? These very unlike each other, right? Butterfly and plant. Right? And it's because they're in different codes. And so I couldn't name in animals, I couldn't name a group of ants this genus. Okay, it's a conflict in the same code. But between codes, there can be lots of things called homonyms. Right? Which, you know, in the old days when you just care about like your ability to group of critters, it doesn't really matter. You never look at the other group. But not people doing larger scale analyses, if I care about, you know, if this moth eats this, it's very confusing. You know, writing about the ecology. Sounds like cannibalism. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, another thing people, and so that's one issue with the codes, these overlapping names. Okay. Another issue with the codes is this whole kingdom phylum. So, what's a phylum? Define a phylum. How can I test if something's a phylum versus a genus? Yeah. Small in what regard? Yeah. Yeah, so the thing is there are these ranked groupings, right? Um, but they're sort of arbitrary ranks. Okay. And so it can help. So if you know that if something's in one family, it can be another family. You know that sort of not overlap. But one problem people have is that people often um, think the ranks are equivalent. Right? So I can compare how many families there are in North America versus South America. Right? Well, it could be that people in North America split these up into multiple families more. Okay? And this is that artifact. Okay? So there's this um, <coughs> argument get, getting rid of ranks. Okay? And so some people got so upset, so fed up with ranks, they made up a whole new code. Yeah, it means a fifth code, okay, um, called phyla code. And so 
this just names groups based on phylogenies without ranking them. Right? Um, so you can say angiosperms are the group that is you know, common ancestor of Amborella and oak trees and all the descendants. So that's kind of the plate of the tree, and then it tells you that kind of thing. Is it family angiosperms? Is it class angiosperms? Is it phylum angiosperms? Doesn't matter. It's angiosperms. And then I can have the umbrella group. <coughs> okay, and there's ways of naming it. <coughs> and we won't get into this, let's skip that. But. Okay? And so, in 1998, the video was proposed. We've been working on it since then. And now finally one have a book. So when you name something, it's like, you know, you include the name of whoever first described it, right? So Homo sapiens described by Linnaeus. Okay? Um, <coughs> Aaron's new species described by Floden. Right? For all time, we'll have his name after it. Okay? Um, and so when converting things to a new code, we'll write about a land rush, right? I'm going to re-describe Homo sapiens under this code. It'll be Homo sapiens Omera. So we're going to try to prevent this land rush by having a book. We're going to move over to mammals and things like that. We want a big chunk. Okay. Unfortunately, it's going to be very slow. So it's not there, actually, but it will actually work. Okay. Um, <coughs> and then we'll have just another competing code for a while, too. So we, you know, the code is a logical building adventure and also file a code. At the same time. Okay. Okay. So, <coughs> what's this animal? Sperm whale. Right, what's the scientific name? It could be this, it could be this. Okay. And here's a Wikipedia edit war <coughs> about which name it is. And so it's nice because this shows, it shows a taxonomic debate. Happening where it's recorded. You can see what's going on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Use this Nope, he's wrong. Oh, she used this. Nope, we're going to have to get Your turn. Right? And, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> get more popular language. Right? And so you can get these sort of <laughs> arguments. <laughs> and the new taxonomy serves more staid than this. Okay? Um, but, you know, for text, you'd hope that they could go and say, yep, the correct answer is X, or try and name things that's the correct name. A lot of times in there isn't a correct name. So if someone says, splits those what, that one butterfly species into 10, someone could say, nope, I disagree. I'm just using one. Both are valid. Okay? What you can't do is if you split it into 10, move the type and have the type have a different name. That's not allowed. Whether you consider it 10 or 1 is up to you. Because these, these horrible conflicts, okay? So, <coughs> for example, everyone's heard of Anolis lizards, right? There's a paper a few years ago that said, let's put them up into, into eight genera instead of one genera. So there's only one, you know, we also have some of them, but everything else will change, okay? And this causes multiple changes. You also have to change the Latin to agree with the gender of the noun. So, the species names are Okay. Because they have the right um, <coughs> And so this sort of argument. Okay. And so this generated a lot of discussion. <coughs> okay. And you know, the important thing is, you know, so I treated discussions to look at the answer to do what they did, and they're the most recent taxonomy, and I was told. No, you're wrong. I was wrong. But you can keep both taxonomies going. So depending, some people might call them eight different genera, some people will call them one genus. Both are okay. You pick which side you want. Okay? So this can lead to some confusion, right? Um, and so right now there's, I mean, the codes have no way to solve this. Okay? What people have done <coughs> is name resolution services. You say, okay, you call it Anolis carolensis, I call it something else. And so you have a bunch of papers that want to say, are we talking the same thing or not? So what this does is 
compare a given set of names to other sets of names in other taxonomies. And says, okay, yep, in this taxonomy, that's actually called this. Okay, so like the sperm whale, if you have a bunch of papers that have those two sperm whale names, you might not know that they're the same species, right? But something like this can link them and say, yep, they're the same species. And so there's many repositories with this sort of information. Okay, so here, you know, this information about some species, information about other species, and the overlap in this from other places. There's some information about species in this database, okay, and so forth. There's a lot of these, okay, and all of them might have slightly different taxonomies. Okay, and so an issue with taxonomy now is, you know, resolving those sort of issues. Um, all right. So we talked a little bit about wide name species. Right? We talked about naming higher groups, right? So we have these issues. So that so those issues are mostly about species level, but also higher level groups too. So we have all this fighting, right? What's, what's the use of, utility of naming higher level groups besides species? People don't, so one thing is, in all these codes now, people don't name based on similarity. They name based on clades, right? So, you know, we don't, we, no one will name reptiles anymore. Um, we've won that fight, by the way. That was a fight for a while. Yeah. I mean, I could organize, you know, I could arrange furniture in this room and say, okay, I have flat things and I have things that have backs, and arrange them that way. And people say, why are you wasting your time doing that? Right? So why, why do this ranking and what's the good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about why you might need the name species, so you know what other species and that sort of thing. But why name a genus or things like that? Yeah. Right, so because they're shared history, the related things are similar. Right, so if I say you, this thing's an angiosperm, you know something about it, right? Um, but what do you know about it? It's an angiosperm. It's a flowering plant, okay? Right? Is it photosynthetic? Photosynthetic? Is it photosynthetic? Not necessarily. That's right. There's actually some parasitic endosperms, some orchids that just parasitize. So that's kind of cool. But in general, it would be photosynthetic. Right? But again, it's a bit worth knowing that there could be exceptions to these rules. Right? Um, <coughs> good. Um, oh, is that a question? Um, are there questions about this? I don't describe species or groups, so it's not relevant what I use. Um, if I were to, probably five years ago I would have, but now I'm worried that it's just dead in the water, and so I probably wouldn't bother. But I think it's a better idea than having these ranks. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, the rest of you who describe species, are you doing it under file of code or? Which 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, one thing to think about is like even if people don't formally go over to file code, people are now de-emphasizing ranks, right? So like, what rank is Andrew's perhaps? You know, all the terms are what rank are they? Maybe they have a rank right there between ranks, is that right? Yeah. Mammals has a rank, but no one knows what it is. Right? You know, the mammals. Is a okay. <coughs> um, so we're now into naming groups. Okay. And also with the availability of trees now, you don't have to do things like with all the families and areas. Species and the relationship. Other questions about text systematics taxonomy? One thing you know also for our class is that a lot of the discoveries in macroevolution about processes came from people who were doing taxonomy first. Okay? So Ernst Meyer. Was a taxonomist who looked at the birds, worked on birds. But a lot of ideas about allopatric speciation, ge geography of speciation, came from him. Okay, from knowing his group well, he said, okay, well, I see close related birds, but on different islands, and they often don't overlap. Why is that? Oh, maybe they didn't really speciate. Okay, and so <coughs> taxonomy is strictly just about the naming of groups, right? But from this close contact with organisms, we can start asking other questions. And now it is like we do systematics, actually are doing it to answer evolutionary questions and might not even get around to describing different groups. Which really truly is amazing. Other questions? Those of you who are going to spend your lives doing this sort of stuff, why are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge need, right? I mean, if we're trying to describe speciation processes or adaptation, you know, what's, what's out there, right? I mean, sort of the sort of important first step is to know what's out there. All right, anything else on this topic? So I'll see you on Monday. So despite the syllabus, you don't have to come to school on Friday. <laughs> <laughs>